to see where everyone's calling in from. So can you just type into the chat uh, wherever you're calling in from? Let me close my window. Wherever you're calling in from and like on a scale from one to 10, how serious are you about uh, moving to Europe or France? Um, and 10 being like very serious, one being eh, maybe, I'm just thinking about it. And also, uh, I would love to know if you came to Steven's first presentation two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> there's six, there's like six tens already. <laughs> <laughs> so many tens. Well, we have a lot of people from New York, so I understand. I'm in New York too. I get it. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, you're in Steven's courses. Okay, Victoria, who's in Steven's courses? You can write that in too. All right, we have one eight. We have a few eights. We have a few eights. That's not bad. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen so I can introduce what the Nomadic Network is and all that fun stuff. Let's see if I can do this properly. View present. All right, so for those of you who've not been to a Nomadic Network event, I, I assume a lot of you came to Steven's event because it was awesome and it was crazily attended. <laughs> there were so many people in it. So I assume a lot of you are also from that one. But the Nomadic Network was started by Nomadic Matt um, back last fall. And we actually intended it to be the, a live in-person meetup branch of our company so that travelers could find each other. And also so that travelers could be connected to awesome resources. So we were gonna have like, you know, some happy hours, some talks. This is in the center here, Matt is giving a talk in France um, where Steven is the chapter leader. So we were doing a, a mix of that until the coronavirus, which, you know, put a damper on everyone's plan and we changed everything and made them virtual events. So now we have two to five virtual events a week. And it's been really fun because right now we have uh, people calling in from all over and getting to connected to uh, travel experts or people that are just so willing to share their experience like Steven, who's both a travel expert and somebody who will like to share his experience. And he's living in France, staying in Croatia right now. And so like we get to connect with him and that's what I love about virtual events. So we're really happy about that. Um, just some things to keep in mind for this. This is a special, this is a special one. So it's going to be less of a presentation and more of a Q&A. So we really do want those questions to come through. But basically, you can turn your camera on. This is a community event. Um, we love to see your faces. You don't need to, but it's just a preference of mine. I like to feel like people are in the room. Um, you will be muted just so it's easy. Uh, and then we will have a Q&A pretty much this whole time. Uh, we'll run for about an hour and 45 minutes if we have that many questions. If not, we can end early. Feel free to pop in and pop back out or pop out and pop back in. <laughs> and definitely use the chat to connect with each other, ask questions to each other, ask questions to Steven, share your relevant experiences. I know you know, a lot of you probably have some knowledge on this topic, so feel free to share that in the chat. Also, if you have a question specifically for Steven, it would be great if you could just write question so that we can easily find it because this is a follow up Q&A about um, moving to France and that's awesome. We also have the replays available on our to our Patreon members, which can be found at patreon.com slash nomadic mat. Um, that is an awesome community and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end, but that's where you can find the replay to this. I won't be sending it out if you just ask. It will be on the Patreon website. Um, and then I, just a friendly reminder, we're here to learn, satiate your wanderlust and also have fun. These are like really just community events. So we encourage you to listen with kind ears and to be inquisitive and to just like dream up some 
some travel scenarios. And also our speakers are doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. We do not pay them. They're here because they want to share their experiences. They want to make sure the world knows that travel uh, is possible and they could do it cheaper, better, smarter, longer, you know, all the things that we stand for at Nomadic Mat. And so we're very, very grateful for all our speakers, including Steven, who is amazing. And we're so excited to have him again here today. Um, Steven is an incredible person. I just loved, 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 I'll let him introduce himself again, but I loved his presentation two weeks ago. I was sitting here just in awe of all he shared. Um, Steven is our chapter leader for Paris. He is a very enthusiastic about community. He's super enthusiastic about travel. And he is just one of those like can do attitude type of people. And so he's a really great inspiration and he also has a wealth of knowledge to share with us so i'm glad you guys are all here um and i'm gonna pass the mic on to steven and i'll sort of be doing the q a so be sure to get your questions in if you haven't um, and you could do that throughout all right go ahead steven well hello everybody thank you for being so prompt and on time uh anglo-saxon wise as we would say in, in france and anyone who doesn't speak french or speaks english they just generally refer to them as anglo-saxons right so on time in france is anywhere between 10 or 15 minutes late in anglo-saxon time right so there's still a few more minutes for uh, people to arrive so while we're waiting for those people to arrive on time in France. I'm just going to tell you a really cool travel story because this is a nomadic network event uh, that happened that happened recently. It hasn't happened yet, so I, I'm not quite jinxing it, but I just wanted to throw out a possibility to you. So I, I was born in Singapore and I moved to my, I didn't move, my family moved to America when I was nine. I had to go with them. Nine-year-olds don't really get a vote. And um, Oh, in recent years, I've made it a point to visit, do long visits to Singapore once a year. And my visit to Singapore was planned for September 15th. And last month when I was visiting uh, the United States, it became really clear that the Singapore government was not, not going to allow leisure travelers to come. Um, so what had happened was I had already been on a website called homeexchange.com where you can you can stay at people's houses, they can stay at yours, so you can do swaps. And I had already blocked off six weeks where I was hoping someone would take my place while I was gone in Singapore. And so I was about to go to the website and say, well, not going to Singapore. Might as well take this off. And I get a message from someone saying, hey, is this still available? I know things are strange with COVID. And I thought, okay, well, where is this guy from? Wales. Now, for those of you who don't know Wales, firstly, you're missing out. It's an absolutely gorgeous country, plus it has dragons, right? So you've got an awesome country plus dragons. And I thought, hmm, could I stay in Wales for six weeks? So I just told him straight out, I said, listen, I was going to go to Singapore. I can't go to Singapore now. But why don't we just do a swap? Why don't I just stay at your place? And he, and he said, I never in my life would have thought someone would swap their Paris apartment to go to Wales for six weeks. But if that's what you want to do, man, that's fine with me. <laughs> so as of right now, we have tickets booked, refundable tickets, because EasyJet is being really uh, nice at the moment, which is unusual for EasyJet, as I'm sure many of you know. But his flight to Paris round trip is something like 20 pounds. And my round trip ticket to Bristol, which is the closest airport direct flights to, to Cardiff at the moment, was it's about 70 bucks. And it looks like I may get to stay in Wales for free for six weeks. Um, I never knew about Home Exchange. I'm dropping a link into the chat. I didn't know about Home Exchange at all until er, late last year because in previous summers I had been gone. I had shared, I think, on my last on the last call that this is only the second August in seven years that I've been in Paris. I'm normally gone, as most French are, um, out of out of town during this this period. And um, I thought, oh, it'll be easy to get someone to take care of my apartment in Paris while I'm gone for the summer. And people were, oh, could I, could I do it for two weeks? I said, no, I want it for six weeks. Like, and uh, I don't want to, I don't want to have like three people cycle through. It'll just be easier to give. Now, the other side of that is it's hard to get someone who potentially want your place for six weeks, but it's not a happy ending yet. But just so you know, 
I may get to stay in Wales for six weeks. Um, and we have both committed that even if we get quarantined on arrival, that we'll still do it. So if I have to stay at his place for two weeks and he has to stay at my, because after that we have four weeks of not being quarantined. So we're going all the way with this. Um, so cool story and um, wanted to share that with you guys. Home Exchange, totally cool website. Um, uh, Erica wanted me not to repeat my presentation, but go over the four visa possibilities that I talked about last time. I know about other visa classifications, but I have colleagues who have far more experience with them, especially with, let's say, married couples, uh, uh, children, and I can refer you to them if you'd, if you'd like more help, uh, more answers on those. But the four that I talked about last time were the au pair visa, the student visa, the visitor visa, and the prof lead visa. So I said before that the au pair visa is the easiest to get, but it has an age cap. So you have to be between 18 and 30. And I, I actually dug up from before, way back in like 2015. No, that sounds not that long ago. But I had uh, a lot of friends who were au pairs at the time, and I actually did an interview with them, a little podcast. So I'm dropping that link in the, uh, in the chat. If you want to listen to me chat five years ago with a couple of au pair friends about the au pair life, Remember that in each visa classification, there is a central piece of documentation apart from all the standard stuff. The standard stuff is name, uh, ID, uh, health insurance, um, proof, essentially all the things that you're normally going to need to apply to show that you, you want to stay somewhere. And then there is a central piece of documentation that's endemic to your visa. So for the au pair visa, it's an au pair contract. Now, you don't have to have obtained that before you got here because the au pair visa is really not strict at all. You, you can, you can uh, sometimes apply for it even when you're in France. They're not strict about it. But it's very, very easy to get. That's the central piece of documentation you need for the au pair visa. And if anybody wants, just put in the questions that you want the conditions and I'll read the conditions for them, okay? The central piece of documentation you need for the student visa, of which there is no age limit, you could be a 97-year-old student or a 107-year-old student if you want, is the acceptance letter. You have been accepted to a course of studies. Now, this was asked last time, can I do this for a French immersion course? Yes. But you have to keep in mind that that might only be three weeks or six weeks. So if it's one of those like six month immersion courses, it might be more worthwhile. But if it's anything under than three, anything under three months uh, and you're still trying to figure things out, you could just as easily come here on the tourist visa during normal times. Obviously, there are no tourist visas available at this time. Right. So you, you cannot come to France on a tourist visa at this time. Uh, thirdly, uh, I talked about the visitor visa the chief piece of information they're looking for in the visitor visa is the proof that you have, in, you have access to income so that you can live in France without working in France. Now you have to keep in mind that this visitor visa is conceived pre-internet. So one of the key questions that kept coming up and seems to keep coming up on the internet over and over and over is, am I allowed to earn money outside of France? And I have to repeat this back to people. Why do you think that France has a moral or legal right to prevent you from earning money outside of France? Right? I know that it's scary. It's visa world and I don't know anything. Uh, that's might be what you were thinking. I'm sure it was, it was what I was thinking back in 2013 myself, but there is no way for the French government as you are not one of their citizens to prevent you from earning income outside of their country, inside their country, they can dictate the rules by which you can earn income. Now, obviously, the question is, well, but I'm performing the service in France. And the reality is that in most of the world, the legal law hasn't caught up to the digital reality, right? And I'll give the classic example is I have a Chilean company. I'm taking a Zoom call with a Brazilian client in Miami. Where is that income going to be reported? The question... you. If you talk to tax experts in any of those countries, they could argue you could report those taxes any, in any of those three countries. So at the moment, until the law changes, and the law could change tomorrow, not in France. When I say tomorrow in France, I mean like in 20 years. But if you think about where it is, it's a question of your assertion. So I assert that the income was earned in the United States, therefore it was earned in the United States. 
there's no mechanism that they have. And I'm not trying to say uh, trick the government, lie to the government. I'm saying the law hasn't caught up yet to, to the digital realities. Otherwise, the American businessman who's on vacation in Paris and takes a couple of calls during the week uh, for the board, is he, does he get some sort of pass? Because he's technically working in France. So I just want people to shed this idea that because I'm located in France, that I have to construe that income as French. You could if you wanted to, but you don't have to. The fourth uh, visa I talked about was Profession Liberal. And the key piece of information you need there is, do I have a believable business that the French think that I could successfully start for at least a year? Because they're going to come check on you in a year or you're gonna actually present your case to them. Uh, and, I, and I shared in the last call that a friend of mine has started a picnic business in Paris and there is no certification for picnicism. And uh, it showed that the French were willing to be flexible as long as she was able to make her case. She had some PR work that she'd done, some marketing work, and I think the French were able to fold that into believability. So of course, if you're a graphic designer and you have a graphic design degree, that would be an open and shut case for the French. But don't feel, that you can't do something just because you feel you don't have the paper qualifications for it. Uh, if you have other ways of proving that you can do it, my friend with the picnic business has uh, removed all doubts for me that you, you can do it if you'd like to. Uh, so those were the four visa possibilities. And as I said, I dropped a link to the au pair podcast that I did with some friends a few years ago. So, it's just a few minutes after, so I'm just going to show you guys, uh, and I'll do a quick like uh, commercial for Croatia, I guess. If you've never been to Croatia, it's a very, very old kingdom, but it's only recently, let's say, a nation state in the way that we're used to thinking about the modern nation state. Let me switch this. So here we are. It's sunset, so I'm sorry the sun's like right in our eyes. But this is the Adriatic. So on the other side of that island is Italy. But a few day, a few a few hours journey by boat. Um, but Croatia is this wonderful land of very friendly people right along the coast. And depending on where you are, it's either going to have a very Italian influence. So down south, Dubrovnik and Split is going to have more risotto and pasta and squid ink as part of their diet. And here, uh, I'm, I'm in Senj. If you go a little further inland towards Zagreb, you're going to see less of that and more of the hearty, what I call the food of the 1500s, the food of the Balkans, where it's, uh, I feel like when the food is put in front of me that I should have plowed a field that day in order to deserve the amount of calories that are on my plate. It's like, I didn't plow a field today. Why are you giving me all this food? But you will sleep very easily afterwards along with uh, your slivovica, or as they say in Romania, palinka. And uh, I'm here in Croatia um, because I'm doing some work with a client. And uh, it seemed easier for us to just meet here for Croatia. So now we are going to begin questions. And I'm going to take two questions for every one old question. There are a bunch of old questions that I didn't get to, unfortunately, in our last event. So I'm going to try to pick up as many of those as I can. I'm going to be an answering machine full of everybody's question. If, if you feel like you want to go into a little bit more detail, I can definitely answer um, by follow-up at email, and I'll put my email address in, in there as well for you to follow up with. Okay, so um, Erica, go ahead. Awesome. Okay, I'm trying to categorize these. Um, so these are just general questions that have come through and you guys are great question askers, by the way. Amazing. So Kristen was wondering, how do we see the first video? I'll answer that. It's on patreon.com slash nomadic mat. Uh, it's chock full of advice. So patreon.com slash nomadic mat. At the $5 level, you'll have access to all the TNN replays and it literally it's there. So I'll give you that again at the end, but that's how you can do it. Um, and then Michael was asking, can you do a home exchange with a rental, Stephen? Uh, <laughs> it, it depends on how good your relationship is with your landlord, honestly. It's not illegal to do it um, because I don't own my place. 
but my relationship with my landlord is so good that I built into my contract the right to Airbnb one of my guest bedrooms legally. So I have an excellent relationship. But if you don't have, you'd be surprised. Sometimes because the French are so used to leaving for the summer and having a friend or a relative stay in the apartment, if you simply position it that way, it's like, I might have a friend stay here for a few weeks. Would that be okay? And if you're making it clear you're not earning any money, but you're just doing a swap, like I'm gonna go stay at his place, that removes from their brain this, you are making money and I want to have some of that money uh, voice out of their brain. And so uh, just check with your landlord. It's always better to be straightforward and upfront, I think in any country, but particularly in France, even though the French will tell you to hide stuff from your landlord, uh, don't do that. Um, and then we have a question from Kyle asking, uh, he really wants to know the referral from your colleague who has the expertise in helping married couples with visas. Uh, how can he get that information? Just send me an email, um, Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, at thelifeyouwant.eu. Just send that to me and just say referral for a married couple, and then I'll connect you guys. I just typed it into the chat. Um, do you want one more question since those were really short? Uh, sure. I'll take one more short, and then I'll answer a long all right, this is a very short one. So there's the au pair, the student, the visitor, and what's the fourth visa? Profet, profession liberal. In English, it looks like profession liberal with an E at the end. Profession liberal. There you go. All right. Okay, so interesting question. Um, this was from Doug last time. Have you retained your US citizenship? If so, aren't you obligated to pay taxes on your income and contribute to social security and follow up? Does social security and a pension from the US count for income in France? Okay, so I wanna make sure that people understand that, I, I apologize for the non-Americans here. We have this thing called social security in the United States. This is decoupled from citizenship. So you do not have to be a US citizen in order to collect social security. It's tied to your work years and credits that you've earned in the US based on that. So if you are a foreigner and you worked in the US and you put enough credits into the system, you are owed that social security. If you leave America and never come back, they have to pay it out to you legally. Now, the sort of philosophical question as to whether there will be any money in 20 years when there's no money now, that's a different story, but I'm just speaking about the legalities of the matter and it's not tied to your citizenship. In fact, you can even get your social security deposited into your French bank account uh, on a monthly basis. So you don't have any question about citizenship and social security. As for taxes, the, per the questioner is correct. It's not that you're obligated to pay taxes on your income, you're obligated to file taxes every year in the US. Uh, whether or not you pay taxes is obviously completely dependent upon your own financial situation. But yes, you do have to file taxes every single year. Do not think that you're going to outsmart the IRS ever. Don't ever do that. Um, as to whether I'm going to retain my U.S. citizenship, I can answer that maybe on like a fourth or a fifth AMA. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I would encourage people to be open-minded about that. Um, does Social Security and a pension from the U.S. count as income? Yes, it's your income. And so if you want to add that up together and say this constitutes my 1,400 euros a month of income, good, then you're done. Um, so I guess I want to dovetail that into a larger question, which I saw repeating over and over. And I've seen in some of the follow-up questions that I got, which is this urgency of I want to get French citizenship. And as someone who felt very urgent about this in 2013 as well. I want to push back a little bit on it to simply ask, why is it that you want French citizenship? So if the question is passport access, an EU citizenship only gets you two or three more countries than an American passport does, visa-free, right? And again, I'm talking about residency versus citizenship. People are like, I want citizenship, I want citizenship, okay. Residency is like 96% citizenship. So at, tell me again, why is it that you want citizenship? Uh, it can't be for travel privileges because a US passport will give you the same. Um, I really wanna vote in the French elections. 
okay, if you want to, if that's the thing. <laughs> but I suspect that uh, getting a passport for another country probably is a little bit more than participating in a political system you've never participated in. So that would be my question for anyone who is asked, who's really dead, to, I have to get citizenship. My question would be, why is that? Why is residence insufficient for you? Knowing that citizenship comes with a lot more barriers to get, uh, they've just made the language test harder. The history test has always been fairly difficult for non nerds about French history, which I happen to be, <laughs> happen to be a nerd about French history. But um, there's a few barriers to becoming a French citizen, but becoming a French resident is fairly simple and you still get all the benefits. And one of the things that I was sharing is my European residence meant I flew to the United States last month and came back. I just flew to Croatia. I am flying back next week. <laughs> After that, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Wales. Um, why? Because I have European residence. That wasn't a European citizenship that got me back here. It was European residence. And if this Corona thing that we've been going through has been any test, it's residence. Now, that's not true everywhere. I have a friend who's a resident in Georgia, and they've told him if he leaves, he can't come back at the moment. They're only allowing Georgian citizens to return. So what you're watching is each country handling uh, according to their own culture and norms. But in the EU, it's pretty much been standard. And there's not a single European country that is not letting residents return. Um, but some countries outside the EU are being very strict about citizens. And I think in Asia as well, Vietnam, Thailand um, in particular. And even in Thailand, uh, if you're a citizen and you haven't come back within that first six months, they're making you go through some weird stuff at the moment. Um, had a Thai friend tell me that. Okay, back to the live questions, Erica. Wonderful. Um, also, just a quick follow-up question. Is residency as permanent as uh, citizenship? When you say pertinent. Permanent, permanent. Oh, permanent. Okay, so this is a, a question of permanent residency. I should, I should make the point at a meta level that permanent residency doesn't really exist anywhere in the world. And what I mean by that is all the permanent residency programs that I know about require you to spend some time in the country in a particular time or you lose your permanent residency status. So for example, I have a friend, a French friend, he has Brazilian permanent residency status from a long time ago when he was in love with a Brazilian girl. And every year he flies to Brazil for literally 48 hours. I asked him about this the other day and I was like, why are you doing it? He's like, well, just in case, uh, you know, I ever want to uh, move back to uh, Brazil. So he is, he is literally flying back to Brazil once a year. He, he goes to a city, he gets a passport stamp and he flies back to France. But it's showing you that the permanent residence, there's no such thing as permanent residence. The Singap Singapore permanent residency, they're very strict about this, US green card, and the 10 year card for France, which I'll be getting in the next few months, you're allowed to be out of France for three years only. Now, three years out of 10 is actually pretty good as a non-citizen, but only a citizenship can allow you to just do whatever you want, right? But as far as residency goes, permanent residence, I really feel that's a misnomer in many parts of the world. You don't really get permanent residence. You're gonna to need to prove that you have to come back to that country. It could be three years, five years, 10 year intervals. But if you have to keep coming back, I feel it's unfair to call it permanent residency. So yes, there is quote unquote permanent residency. I'm going to get a 10 year card. Um, but then after that, I'm going to get citizenship. So it won't matter. But that would be the closest I could get to permanent residency is continuing to renew that 10 year card every 10 years. Does that make sense? Yes. And then we also had someone, well, Chris, who's the US tax specialist say that one reason that people might want to get the citizenship is to give up their US citizenship because we need another one. Chris, that's an excellent point. Um, sort of a traumatic emotional question, I think, for a lot of people about renouncing US citizenship. And that's why I think that could be a, another webinar on its own, like renouncing US citizenship, what does that mean? Um, but yes, uh, simply on, on a tax issue, if it were only that, I would, I would see that. But obviously renouncing citizenship isn't only about, isn't only about taxes. There's probably a lot of other issues at play. But sure, uh, uh, one of the things, that people can do once they renounce their U.S. citizenship is get involved in different financial things that 
because of what FATCA has done and how the U.S. has managed to intimidate and bully both um, tax regimes and banks around the world that people are like, you know what, I just, uh, you have an American citizenship, you can't get a bank account with us. So there are bank accounts and credit cards that I can't get in Europe because I'm a U.S. person. And they're like, you know what, we don't want to deal with your compliance nonsense. So I'm out. So what it can do is it can open up possibilities for you because you're no longer a U.S. person. But um, if Chris is a tax specialist, I would, I would encourage people to have a conversation with him uh, about that. But as I say, it's not simply a financial question. It's a deeply emotional one. I have a follow-up question to that from Marcella, who is asking, is it possible to open a French bank account while still in the U.S.? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Um, there are two ways that you could do this that I've heard from my clients. One is with HSBC and the other is with Bank of the West slash BNP Paribas. Now the reason is, is because they both have stateside branches. However, I'm told that the minimum opening balance could sometimes be 20 or $30,000. Uh, and then they can transfer it. But some of the time it isn't. So I had a friend who opened, I think, with like a $1,000 balance. And then they, they were then able to say, oh, I have an HSBC account in America. Oh, that's fine. You can open up an HSBC account in France. Uh, so um, you can open up a French account. I guess my question would be, why would you feel the need to open up a French account while you're not here? Um, especially if you don't have a, a French address. For example, um, the, uh, the, the websites that can get you by in the meantime would be things like TransferWise and N26 to help you. You can pay with a European bank account. You can receive money in euros, but you, don't, you have no requirements uh, as far as the money uh, and you have no, um, no minimums that you have to keep in the account. So you could have a life in Europe and they even give you debit cards. Uh, free debit cards, actually. So, we can take one of your older questions. Sure. Um, can you comment on any differences that will apply to visa distribution after Brexit? Um, the French system doesn't have quotas in place for us, at least. So, one of the things I try to remind people is don't forget that you got a lot of passport privilege with your dark blue passport in Western European countries. We don't, when, we, when you go to the immigration offices here, you're not gonna stand in the same lines as the immigrants from Africa and Asia. Those rooms are much larger and for some, for whatever reason, and I'll leave it to you to, to think through that, um, they get a little bit more scrutiny than we do. So um, the, the, there, is, there is no quota that I know of. It's not, uh, the French, unlike, the, when I think about a strict system, I think of New Zealand and Australia. They have a points-based system. If you get the points, you will maybe get an invitation, but you still have to get the points first. And uh, it's not like that here in France. If you, if you meet what they have, it's not necessarily a lottery system. And again, I'm speaking from the privileged North American position. Um, I still don't think there are quotas at the African and the Asian levels. I just think they scrutinize you more. That's all. All right. Uh, Okay, we have some uh, tax questions. So okay. Asking, can you comment on taxes for American expats as double taxation or does Franco-US treaty agreement meaning, mean that Americans pay no more than if they lived in the US? Yeah, no, uh, we don't. We have a tax treaty with the French, so we won't have double taxation. But again, that's something you need to consult with with your accountant. If you're a French resident, you're going to be a fiscal resident here, so you have to file taxes in France. But there are ways to minimize your tax burden in both countries. Uh, as I said, one of the benefits that I experienced in COVID, paying taxes to two countries meant that I got bailout money from two countries. So it's the only time that I've been happy to pay taxes to two countries. But uh, normally speaking, that's an accountant question. The, I guess the heart of your question is, am I going to get taxed twice? No, because we have a tax treaty, but you need to make sure either your accountant is doing your French and American tax. Few years and encourage that communication. So, you cut out for me just the last sentence. I don't know if you. Okay, yeah. I you, said my my French 
uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> so my French and my American accountant have been talking for years. And so if you don't have the same person doing both returns, then you need to make sure those two people are talking. So one of the ones, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about until they live outside of the United States is something called the FEIE, the Foreign Earned Income Exemption. And it's for anybody who's outside of the United States for more than 333 days a year. You're basically only allowed to be in the U.S. for 30 days a year, and they monitor that. And so um, if, you, if you do that, if you only go to America for, let's say, 27 days a year to visit family or to do whatever you want, you have up to 102,000 of exempted income. So for a lot of people, that's, that's plenty for them. And, and again, depending on what your plan is with your accountant and how your assets are, that's, we can't answer that question individually for everybody. But generically speaking, remember that the U.S. tax code is optimized for small businesses, not for individuals. So there are different ways that you can optimize your tax situation before moving here. Awesome. And then Alicia is asking, is it true that dividends, capital gains, interest from U.S. investments are not taxed in France, only the income generated while you're in France? By which, by which country? France. So like anything you, you earn in the U.S., it's not taxed in France. You just, whatever you earn in France is taxed. I believe that's the question. Right. Well, I mean, there are two things to that. One is it's unlikely that as a U.S. person, you're going to be able to do any investments in Europe. They are very restrictive about that because of the auditing um, problems. But I, again, I, I would defer to an accountant on this. But it, again, it seems to me that U.S. income is cannot be construed as French income. And in fact, I think there's some problems these days. One of my friends who is a dual national Belgian U.S. Uh, got a nasty letter from E-Trade. Uh, telling her that she's not an American resident and she can't have an E-Trade account anymore. And they shut down her E-Trade account and gave her all her money, uh, hitting her with an enormous capital gains tax. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen to you. I'm not saying that happens to everybody. I'm just saying you have to look at your individual tax situation and see how it works. I can't give a generic answer on that. Okay. You can take an older question. Uh, this one was kind of a fun one. You said you, you use fewer spices now. Which ones do you regularly use in your French cooking? And I had mentioned that the French had reverse brainwashed me growing up half Chinese. We tend to use a lot of spices in our cooking because the idea is of transforming the protein into something else. So it's not pork, it's sweet and sour pork. Uh, but in, in French cooking, it's about making the protein the protein. So it's going to be the chickeniest chicken you've ever chickened. And what that means is real minimalism when it comes to the spice profile. So you're talking about salt, pepper, lemon, tarragon. Um, it's very, very minimalist. And it's weird because I have an enormous spice rack from years of, of and I still, when I make Chinese dishes, obviously, I, I just kind of turn my French brain off. But um, you can't be around these people and with their cooking without absorbing their ideas. And I subconsciously absorbed the idea that you're not supposed to transform your protein. <laughs> and, and years later, I'm, you know, I subconsciously become French in, in the way that I cook. Um, let's see. Um, if you are on a student visa, are you able to work a remote job out of the USA? Yeah, again, I addressed that in the very beginning of today's Q and A, but the French have no moral or legal right to prevent you from working a job in another country. It's just the reality of life. Until such time as people can show me where that says it in the law, but for now they, they can't do it. They only have jurisdiction over France. They don't have jurisdiction over other countries. They can't tell Germany that you're not allowed to be employed there. And in fact, um, on my way to the visa class that I have now, I got a work visa in Switzerland while I had a visitor visa in France. So that means I got a work permit to work. And keep in mind, Switzerland's not in the EU, but it's in the EEA. But I got a work permit to work inside Europe, outside of France. And I showed that work permit as part of my documentation to get the visa classification I have now. So again, that's more proof. The French can't stop me from getting a job in Switzerland. It's up to the Swiss to decide how they want to accept a, a non EU national. Uh, the sort of sad story about that is after my, I, I had these two incredible summers of working in Switzerland, which is the only place I'd ever leave France for. 
I mean, Switzerland's like the perfect country. And uh, the third year, the Swiss had a referendum the previous year that restricted visas of non-EU nationals. So in February, the person I'd been working with said, Stephen, we just ran out. Like they had restricted it so much that by February, they had no more slots left for the year. So they couldn't offer me the July job. Um, but I respect it. Hey, it's the Swiss. It's their country. They can decide who wants to work there or not. Um, but I have wonderful memories. And uh, I could do a separate webinar AMA on Switzerland. I, I love that place. Uh, another time. Keep the questions coming, Erica. Got it. Okay, we have some visa questions. So this is from Marcella. She said, when applying for a long stay visa in France, do all birth certificates, marriage certificates, etc., have to be no more than 90 days old? And which documents have to be translated into French? Great question, but you're thinking about renewal. You're not thinking about application. So when you apply for your visa the first time, you don't need a birth certificate. And remember that whenever you're applying from your home country, the documents need to be in the language of your home country. So for example, one of my clients who just put in her package in Australia, which is a sort of other question, Stephen, is France accepting applications from some countries? Apparently the consulate in Sydney is open. So it depends on which country you're in. But she just put in her prof leave dossier two weeks ago. Um, and uh, everything was in English. She, she was a little nerdy and she put her cover letter in French and they were super impressed. <laughs> but they told her, you didn't have to do this, you know, this is Australia. Um, so you submit your, your application in the language of your home country. When it comes to renewal, that's when they're going to ask for your birth certificate and that's where your 90 day rule is helpful. Now, I ha I've seen this unevenly enforced, but for those who don't know, the French can sometimes be finicky that this translation is only, uh, it's 97 days old. And, and again, this is one of those, you know, your English speaking brain turns on and says, well, has my birth certificate changed in the last X number of years since I was born? And the French brain goes, uh, the rule is 90 days. And uh, this is not 90 days. You know, this, uh, uh, the classic, I, I tell people, if you want to understand the French, a, a classic example is Clouseau at this hotel in the Pink Panther. And Inspector Clouseau, if you don't know, Peter Sellers is an absolute legend. So Peter Sellers is at this front desk and this dog is sort of yapping. And he turns to the front desk clerk and he says, uh, is, uh, does your dog bite? And the front desk clerk says, uh, no, no, monsieur. And, and Clouseau reaches down and tries to pet the dog and the dog bites him. Clouseau says, I thought you said your dog does not bite. And the front desk clerk says, that sir is not my dog. <laughs> uh, and it's a sort of uh, classic thing of the French like, that's not my problem. So when you tell them like this translation is 97 days old, and like that sir, is not my problem. The, the rule says 90 days. So I've seen this unevenly enforced. For example, my translation of my birth certificate, I did that in 2014. It has no date on it. And I've never had to repeat it. Uh, I've had people, however, who had one like five months and the person said, this is five months old, you need a new one. It's the same thing with um, your electricity bill. Um, in France here, if you want certain things, there, you need proof and you're gonna use your electricity bill. The electricity bill has to be from the last 90 days. So just something in the French brain about the last 90 days, it's real. And anything more than the last 90 days, it's not real. Um, so don't translate your document before you need to, and you certainly aren't going to have to translate your birth certificate for the application. It's going to be for your renewal one year after you get here. Worry about it then, pay for it then, uh, and then it'll be fresh. It'll be your 90 day thing. All right. We have two questions about student visas. One from Kristen, who's stuck in Portugal, and she said, for the student visa, must we apply back in our home country or can we apply while we're in Europe? She doesn't want to go back to the USA. <laughs> I, I, I understand. Now, I will argue, if your consulate is open, the French are really big on taking student visas right now. That was a big uh, point in government policy about a month ago. And today, one of the French ministers gave a speech about welcoming foreign workers uh, to help bounce back from coronavirus. So uh, I understand the, the problem that you're explaining. However, you have to realize what your status is. And I don't know what status you are in Portugal. Um, 
but unless you hold some kind of European status that allows you to apply from Europe, you're going to have to go back to your country of citizenship to apply for a new visa. So some visa classifications will allow you to change over, but unless you hold some kind of French visa classification to change over to a student visa, you can't, shall we say, transition from a Portuguese student visa to a French student visa. Does that make sense? Unless you have some sort of Portuguese um, citizenship relationship. Uh, if you have Portuguese residency, you can just come to France and the EU is open. So if you have uh, residence status in Portugal, welcome. See you next week. What if you're just stuck because of the pandemic? What if you're American, you're just on a tourist, I believe. You, 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 cannot come, you cannot come to France. Now, mind you, I'm going to say this very carefully. You cannot legally come to France at the moment on a tourist visa. Have I met Americans who have, where there's a will, there's a way, made it into France? Yes, I have. In the last several weeks, several of them. Uh, especially coming through Germany because there are no border checks in Germany. So somehow they made it to Germany and somehow they slipped across the border. But you cannot legally be here. And then I think the more important question is, do you want to stay here? You don't need looking over your shoulder. You don't want to think about how I'm going to travel and what the person's going to do with your passport. You don't want to be stuck inside France with no way to, to get out without losing status. So I, as painful as it might be, try to find out if your consulate's open because the French are accepting student visas. Okay. Cool. And then Donald has a question. I feel like I know the answer from your last talk, but Donald was saying, being 60 years old, I'm allowed to audit classes at my local U.S. college for free. Are you aware of any colleges in Paris that allow you to do the same? Um, I, I understand you're asking from a very U.S.-centric perspective where uh, a college education is the cost of an investment banking salary. Um, but classes don't cost anything over here. Um, universities are free. <laughs> so the question is, uh, would you like to audit? Um, I've had numerous friends tell me that you can just go to a French classroom and ask if you can sit in the back and they'll let you do it. There's not a question of, I need to enroll and quote unquote officially audit for free as a retiree. Although you might enjoy the fun paperwork that that involves <laughs> and pay the whatever, six euros you might need for a book or something but remember that universities here are free so the question of auditing something for free doesn't make as much sense here you can just ask the professor if you can sit in on the class for the semester and he'd be delighted to the french especially if you ask in french um he'd be delighted to let you do that awesome uh let me just see uh, then we have one other question that's related. It says, does anyone know if the French embassies in the USA are currently accepting applications for student or au pair visas? I know they are not accepting applications for long stay visas right now. Are you aware? I'm not aware of any that are open. I'm not saying that they're not because again, I think there's an uneven policy depending on the state. Uh, if your state, for example, is quote unquote open, maybe the consulate is open too. But there hasn't been, a, remember that the consulates operate autonomously. For example, the Houston consulate is sometimes open when the, when the Chicago consulate is closed be, just because of the idiosyncrasies of Chicago and Houston. So they don't operate as an entity. Um, the best thing to do would be to check. And I, I was chatting with a, with a client last week and I had, I had um, put to her this interesting question because it, this was just resolved, um, I think five days ago that Americans who cannot get a negative COVID test, because the directive currently is uh, on Americans traveling from America, but if you have uh, permission to be in France, you can get a waiver from your local consulate that you weren't able to get one of these 72 hour tests. So if the consulate's available to give you a waiver, I feel they're at least answering the telephone. I don't think I don't think they're closed like March and April closed, um, but I don't, I don't know. Um, the best thing to do is to ask. And I suggested to this client, maybe you can go to another consulate that isn't your consulate and maybe they'll allow you to process there. It's a weird times they may, the worst thing you can do is ask. And so um, I suppose I want to, to tell the story about the worst thing that you can do is ask as an interlude. So we'll just take a, a break from questions. I wrote an article that I finally published a couple days ago on my blog about getting pickpocketed in France. So do you know what that means? That means I don't have my residence card. 
it got stolen. It got stolen in November. And it was an quote unquote inconvenient time. I don't know when it's ever convenient to get robbed. But I was just about to embark on a series of trips, which included Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, um, Italy. Uh, and I didn't really need my French residence card uh, in any of those places. And good luck getting an appointment in December with the French bureaucracy. So it just, it sort of, you know, it wasn't on my radar and it was gonna be like 300 euros to get the replacement card. So it just wasn't on my radar. And then this thing happened in March. I don't know if it's happened to you guys, but some, something happened in March that sort of changed conditions for people. But this meant that I definitely couldn't get the card. Now, the problem is, legally speaking, I need to display that card. But because of my confidence with French bureaucracy over the years of dealing with them and consulting and helping other people to deal with them, I knew that it was about friendliness and asserting my rights legally. So what did I have? I had a photocopy of the front part of my residence card. So I am in O'Hare uh, at the Aer Lingus desk. And this girl's like, where's your card? I was like, um, I have a photocopy of my card. I was pickpocketed. Here's a copy of the police report. And her colleague's like, oh, dude, you got to have a real thing. He's like whispering to her, like, don't, don't allow this. And I said, listen, the French will accept it. I'm a resident of their country. I got pickpocketed. I haven't been able to get a replacement. I just stayed calm. I didn't, I was in America, right? So it's like, I'm being super friendly. There's like three people in the airport. And she's like, okay, okay. It seems like this is fine. So that was the first hurdle is in America, I didn't have my, res my residence card, my actual residence card. I had a photocopy of a residence card and a police report indicating that my residence card was stolen, which that's a key thing. That was so clutch. The French want you to have evidence that your card was stolen. <laughs> this is, again, totally French thing. I get to France, and uh, he sees the American passport, and the first question he asks in French, he says, what are you doing here in French? And I said, oh, I live here in French, and replied. He goes, oh, uh, where's your residence card? <laughs> and so I hand over the photocopy, <laughs> and he said, he said, where's your card? I said, oh, it was stolen, and telling him in French, and I hand over the police report. And this seems to satisfy him. And then he looks down and goes, well, this was stolen in November. And I said, and try getting an appointment. And he goes, ah, okay. Boom, boom. End of story. So then I'm thinking, I'm going to go to Croatia. Now, normally speaking, uh, Croatia is not in Schengen. So I normally have to get my passport stamped anyway. But if you looked on the Croatian and the U.S. websites about travel guidance for Americans, it wasn't clear to me whether I was going to be treated as a US citizen or an EU resident. I'm both, right? So it was however the Croatian border guard decided to. Now, on July the 10th, uh, Croatia put that Americans coming from America need to have a test within 48 hours of arrival showing negative. <laughs> so. I read this like Friday night, like my flight's on Sunday. And I'm thinking, but I'm not a US person in this case. I'm coming as a European resident with a photocopy, right? <laughs> so I say, okay, now they're doing free testing at what is called the Periplage. So every year in August, the French, the, the, pre, the, the Paris uh, mayor's office dumps a bunch of sand on both the canal, uh, the Bassin de la Villette, and on the Seine and pretends it's a giant beach party, even though it's the Seine and you would never swim in that for a million dollars. And so um, they were doing free testing at Perry Plage. Uh, and they're also doing free testing at the airports at both Orly and Charles de Gaulle. Now the testing at Orly and Charles de Gaulle, they were gonna give you the results within 24 to 48 hours, but I knew it was too late on Friday for me to make that. So I went to this free testing, I, I kid you not, it was like, please write your name on, on this. And so my blood test has Steven Heiner, my date of birth, right? And so after I get a negative test, there's a sticker with my handwriting saying that I got a negative result. Like it's the least official thing that you could ever imagine. But I tuck it in my folder because I think, hey, I'm gonna have an answer to every question this guy has. I get to Croatia and he goes, uh, where are you, you, you are transiting through Paris. And I said, no, I live in Paris. He says, oh, let me see your residence card. Put down the photocopy. <laughs> goes, uh, no, no, you're, you're real resident. I said, uh, no, I, I got pickpocketed, police report. 
He goes, uh, but this, this, this police report says November. And I said, I know it's been uh, very difficult to get an appointment. He goes, oh, okay. So uh, combine COVID with friendliness and bravado. And sometimes you can get into a place that you have no business getting into with a photocopy. That said, I'm not going to push my luck. And when I get back to France, I'm going to go get what is called a recipe say. So it's just going to be a, a document that's uh, a little paper document. You go to the police station. I'm going to give them a passport photo and then it'll show my legal status. Um, I'm not going to push my luck, shall we say. <laughs> so I'm going to get a legal uh, document without necessarily paying for the card right away. Um, and I can talk about the tenure card if people have questions about that. But I guess I just wanted to say, never underestimate the power of friendliness uh, to help make up for the fact that you don't have the paperwork required. I did it in the US, I did it in France, and I did it in Croatia. Uh, people, I think, are a little more understanding at the moment. That's a beautiful story. Oh, <laughs> teddy bear. Love it. Uh, people are just trying to help other people. It's a good world out there. Um, okay, so we have some questions about jobs. I know I'm like scattering these questions, so I have all the ones that anyone's asked so far, so they'll be coming up. Um, June is asking, she plans to start a general consulting business based in France where the services offered are pretty broad. It would be an IT business consulting for her US clients. I think it's a her, sorry if you're not. Um, as well as a business English consulting for the French. Will this work for the professional liberal visa? visa? Sure. Remember, it's not um, the, the the litmus test is always, do, can you convince the French that you can do this business and that a demand exists for this business? So for example, if you say, well, I'm qualified to produce uh, artificial olive trees that serve lemonade. Um, well, is there anyone in France who is gonna buy that? You need to produce evidence of potential clients. So if it's, and it sounds like you have a pretty well thought out business plan. So just as long as you can present to the French that you're qualified to do this uh, and you can produce letters of interest from people who, again, it's not a contract. All they have to say, I could write you a letter of interest. Erica could write you a letter of interest. It just has to say, I would be interested in your services if and when uh, you start your business in France. So you, and um, that is part of the believability of your dossier. It's not the thing, but it's the most crucial part of your dossier. The believable part of, I can do this business and people would want to hire me. Okay, cool. And then Susan is asking, can you do multiple things under one business plan? Like teach English, give cooking lessons and also run an Airbnb. <laughs> uh, uh, legally, no, uh, actually, yes. And when I say legally, I don't mean it's illegal. The, the French want you to generally apply under one or maybe two classifications, just in terms so they know where to put you uh, in their system of organization. So for example, the classification I'm under is called formateur, which is broadly, let's say, coach, mentor, something along those lines. And I also have a writing classification. So I applied for two. Um, but you, it, it's like anything, in your business, in any business you have, you could do other things, but you don't need to tell everybody everything that you're doing. As far as the French go, it's not good to tell them everything you're interested in doing because they'll be confused. So just say, I'm gonna do these, make sure they're related. Like don't say, I'm gonna uh, be a chef and I'm also um, gonna run a CrossFit gym. I mean, well, maybe those two things go together. You gain weight, you lose weight. Um, but the point is, don't confuse the French. Like make it, if you're going to apply for two classifications, make the classifications related, but don't tell them three because they're going to say, what is this? Remember, you're allowed to earn money in any number of ways that you'd like under your umbrella. So you can earn the money that way. Um, and interestingly, your Airbnb income in France doesn't need to be housed under a corporation. So it's a single line item on your French return. As long as it's under um, 18.5, I think is the latest number. As long as it's under 18.5, it's a single line item. You don't put it under your business. In fact, it's way more complicated to put Airbnb income under a corporation in France. When you become a commercial landlord, the tax rates are dreadful. Okay. So anything under 18K, 
versus anything over like 22K. When, you, when you're earning more than 22K on Airbnbs in France and you want it to be legal, you're going to have to become a commercial. And then it makes sense to have three or four, uh, get a JIT or something like that so that you can bear the, the tax burden. Okay. I have another question from Alexis. Do you know of Americans who have moved to France and one worked for a U.S. company in a French office or two worked in an international organization? She says, I know this can be kind of competitive, but I'm asking for myself and others who want to work within the fields we studied in the U.S. How would we go about this path? When, uh, if I, am I understanding the question correctly that she just wants to work for a U.S. company in France? Or an international company in France. Um, does she already work at that company and that company has a branch office in France? No, I believe it's for Okay, your, your, your best bet is to already work for the company somewhere else and to get a, it's already extremely, so I had a friend who worked for Match.com and she transferred from the New York office to the Paris office. And she said it was like she had to call in every favor she'd ever earned in her time in New York in order to be able to apply for that when it opened because it's hyper competitive. Now, I don't know that Paris is as competitive as, let's say, London or Bangkok. It, it depends on what your slot is. But they're going to lean on an internal hire first because they already have you're, – they're not – you're less of a risk to the company. I'm not saying it's impossible, but to your, your – in the question you embedded, is it competitive? Yeah, it's super competitive. But generally my friends that I know or my acquaintances who've come over as US citizens working for a US company on either a US or a French contract worked for that company already, or they had a really good in to be hired for a new position because it's extremely expensive to sponsor you. It's just, you need to be someone really special to be sponsored because you're betting that there's people in 27 countries who can't do what you do and who don't have to do any visa paperwork. They just get to move. Um, and that's a difficult proposition for a French company. So would that be the same question as Jahanara, who's asking how difficult is it to get a job in France in general as a non-EU citizen, even if, like they have a master's degree? Having a master's degree is nothing special in a country in which you generally get master's degrees if you go to college. Remember, it's free to go to college here. <laughs> so like getting a master's is like taking a victory lap. Uh, they didn't have to pay 25 grand like you and I did. So um, having a master's is nothing special here. Um, it doesn't mean that you're, you're worthless. It just means that's not what's going to help you. It's not going to help you stand out. What's going to help you stand out is some particular, as I said in the previous webinar, a particular Liam Neeson-esque set of skills uh, that distinguishes you from your EU competition, who pro provides no problems or extra cost to the company, whereas you come with a whole raft of problems legally and financially. All right. Grab a um, I'm going to throw in a quick one here. Does owning a property in France make it easier to get a visa? No. End of. Anyone can buy property in France. The French market is open for business. You can buy anywhere, but that doesn't mean you get to move here. You can't go, well, I own a house in France. And the French go, thank you. That doesn't give you visa status. It doesn't move you to the front of the line. It doesn't give you a special sticker. You just own a property. Um, there's, no, there's nothing that comes with that, unfortunately. All right. So these are some general questions. Um, what's the best way to find an apartment once you move to Paris? Okay, well, even before you move, I'm gonna drop a link for you. Now, the way that we get apartments in Paris, uh, believe it or not, is you send an email or a text message to your friends that says something along the lines of, does anybody know anybody who's got an apartment available? And within 72 hours, you have an apartment. <laughs> um, that's just how it works. Um, if not, I'm dropping a Facebook group into the chat. Join that Facebook group. It's called Housing in Paris. It has 30,000 members. And for those of you who don't have a French network ahead of time, uh, this is a way to get a free French network. And what I think is interesting about this group, I still monitor this group even though I have like a great apartment and I'm not worried about it because A, I wanna keep my finger on the pulse of what things cost and what's available out there. But also too, in case any of my friends ever ask, I wanna have other options available. 
So this, if you peruse, go through the old listings from, you know, however long, you can get a sense of what's available in France, how much it costs. Um, now that's housing in Paris, but I think there are similar groups, uh, let's say housing in France or housing in Lyon or Grenoble or something like that, but they're going to be much smaller. Obviously housing in Paris, 30,000 members is probably going to be the, the largest Facebook group you find, but that's uh, something that you, you want to ask for. Hmm. Interesting. Really great. You're such a connector, Stephen. I love it. <laughs> well, while I'm on that, I guess I'll drop a couple more groups in here. <laughs> My own um, American in Paris um, Facebook Q&A group. So these are people who just read my blog and we basically just serve as a small community for people who have questions about stuff or we try to refer stuff. So that's there. I put that in there. And then there is a just um, sort of Paris, uh, Paris French lovers uh, Facebook group, which is just cool photos or recipes or interesting news articles, um, much more casual. You won't find housing in that Facebook group, but, um, but you will get those. <laughs> you will. <laughs> um, all right, let's keep going. Okay, so Faye, who obviously has a small dog, uh, wonders how it is moving to and living in Par Paris with a small dog. She read an article that many French people abandon their pets when they go on vacation because it's inconvenient. So she's wondering if it's hard to find a vet or a dog sitting service there. Uh, that's not the experience that I have. Um, so the French love their dogs uh, almost a little too much maybe. Um, and their cats too. It's hard to tell whether Paris is a dog town or a cat town because you don't see the cats. The cats don't go on walks, right? They just run the apartments and allow their owners to sleep there. Um, but I think that, uh, first of all, there's a great site, which I referred to on the last webinar called Trusted Pet Sitters and TrustedHouseSitters.com. But you can find people who literally love animals and have glowing reviews from previous like pet encounters. Like, you know, uh, my cat like cried when this pet sitter left, uh, these sorts of things. And uh, you, what you're offering these people is your place to stay. So your pet doesn't even have to leave your house and the, the familiar confines, but you're giving this person a place to stay. So there's lots of people who will do it for free. Just let them stay at your place. I know a friend who he literally cat sits around the world. It's the, I, 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 when I say it, I just smile because I think it's the most hilarious thing ever. He, he's a programmer, right? So he can work from anywhere, but he just moves to his next cat sitting assignment. Uh, like he was in Mexico City once for like three months. And I said, this is really cool. He happens to love cats, but like, keep in mind, sometimes there's extreme requests. Like he, this cat was quite old and medicine had to be administered, not necessarily orally. Um, so you gotta, you gotta love your animals. You really gotta love your animals to do this. But um, as for the French, I, I've never had one of my French friends who's had a pet abandon their pet. I have had two pets sit. I have pet sitted, I have pet sit a bird before I bird sat before. Um, I haven't ever dog or cat sat, but um, there's networks in Paris. And if you don't have networks, as I said, there's trusted house. And I think in Paris alone, there's like 14 cat people who are like, where is your cat? And when can I take care of it? Uh, kind of thing. So. <laughs> That's adorable. Um, and then we have another question about apartments. Alicia's asking, do you, have a, do you have to have a guarantor in order to rent an apartment or can you show proof of income from US investments? Uh, the answer is yes <laughs> to both. Um, remember that whenever you're looking at a Parisian apartment, so remember outside of Paris, it's frankly quite easy to get an apartment. But inside Paris, you're looking at 20 to 30 people for every apartment competing with you. Um, Erica, I'm sure it's probably the same in New York City, right? It's probably some, something, I mean, not anymore, <laughs> but back in the day, um, it was pretty hard to get a New York, New York City apartment. So um, my French friends will sometimes, uh, they're going to illegally, I've had French friends who've used their other friends as pay stubs to have the most, ex the biggest, <laughs> We, we because ultimately all they care about is how much money do you make every month, right? So they, I've had French friends use their other friends, like fraudulent, <laughs> fraudulently use their other friends' pay slips to put forward that they make 250K a year or some crazy number. 
Um, having a guarantor is only an additional awesomeness in your application. But what they really want to know is how much money you make. The asterisk here is sometimes some French landlords don't like the fact that you're a foreigner. On the other hand, there is an entire fan club of American, uh, there's an entire fan club of landlords in Paris who only rent to Americans. <laughs> because we have, this, we have this law and order reputation that we're always gonna pay our bills. Like, I don't know if it's programmed into our brains or this is the impression we've given to the French, but Americans before you have given the impression or actually done it, have always paid their bills. So they're never gonna leave a French landlord holding the bag. <laughs> Whereas the French know all of the ways not to pay rent legally. <laughs> and so some French landlords won't rent to French people, um, which is a bit hilarious, uh, but it's the truth. So having a guarantor plus a really awesome paycheck is going to help you, but it still doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the apartment. You've just got to be, you've got to have that biggest pay stub in there. That's your best bet, honestly. I hate to say it, but it's the reality. You want to take an old question? Sure. Um, if you want to work re remotely as a digital nomad and have no intention to work in France, is it best just to do the visitor visa? Yes. I've said this before. If you have income outside of France, and you don't want to get into the intricacies of starting a French business, you don't need or want French citizenship, you're very happy with French residency, then get a visitor visa. It's the third easiest, it's the third easiest visa to get behind the au pair and the student visas. And you can continue to work your remote job. And as I've said before, I've had clients who've given paycheck stubs from their remote jobs as proof of income which refutes the idea that the French don't allow you to have a remote job on a visitor visa. Otherwise, how did they get their visitor visa by showing their paycheck stub from their remote job? Um, so I've just had too much experience of this to believe the sort of scare tactics used from so-called authorities on the internet that you can't do this. Uh, it's just not true. Um, just not true. Interesting. I have some questions about cars. I'm not sure if you sure. can. Sure. I know you said you gave up your car or you don't have one there, but can you talk about the driver's license? Uh, Stephanie's asking her state has uh, reciprocity. And so what does that look like if she were to come and move to France? Okay, so um, if your state has reciprocity, and for those who don't know, um, the uh, France treats each state as its own country for purposes of license exchange. So if you have a license, and you can search this on the internet, like uh, countries that offer reciprocity with France, driver license, and type in something like that. And I wanna say it's something like anywhere between 27 and 37 states. It's not all of them by any, by any long shot. For example, I think Kansas has it, but Missouri doesn't or vice versa. Um, if you go within your first year, you can simply swap it out. If you don't do it in your first year, you're out. You have to, you're a 16 year old French kid, essentially. <laughs> I don't care how much driving experience you have. They only allow that swap in your first year of residency. And what was interesting was that I didn't, um, I never did it because I, I had no interest. I was so like done with cars and driving that I didn't pursue it. But a few hacks that I've shared in an article before is one, if you don't have reciprocity, uh, find a way to get a driver's license in a U.S. state that does have reciprocity. Maybe you have a friend there, you have a relative there, uh, get a cable bill sent somewhere, show up in that state, swap your driver's license, and suddenly you've got a driver's license from Virginia. And then when you get there, um, swap it out. Now you've got a French license. And Virginia doesn't care that you never renewed. In the meantime, if you do have to turn in your U.S. license in order of, as part of the swap, go back to Virginia or your home state and just say, hey, I lost my driver's license. And now you have two licenses, right? So um, there are ways around this so that you don't have to take the ultra draconian. Uh, <laughs> like there's trig, there's trig on the French license test. Like <laughs> if I, I wrote an entire review about it on the blog, but there's a great book, sort of sad and tragic book called French license by a guy named Joe Start and his, um, travails of getting a French license. But I just, I really encourage you, if you want to have a car, just swap it in your first year. If you come from a state that doesn't have reciprocity, find a way to get a license from a state that does have reciprocity and do a swap. Do not 
enter like the French licensing system. It's going to cost you a lot of time, money, and pain. And that would also include if you wanted to like rent a car your third year or something like that, you would still need a license, right? So you would want so, it in the first year. Technically, it's illegal for me as a French resident to rent a car on my U.S. license. Right. But if you have to <laughs> first year you no, have no one at the car rental desk asks me my citizenship or residency status <laughs> i want you to think about that like when would you go to a car rental facility and say uh monsieur uh what's a country are you a citizen of they want to see your driver's license and your credit card dude like that's it uh and so i don't rent cars very often in france but when i do i feel like the what is that the most famous man in the world i don't always rent cars in france but when i do I use my driver's license and I don't get any problems with it. So um, we have, we have two follow-up questions for the license. So yep. Stephanie's asking, how do you drive after one year? If you know driver's license, you have to get the driver's license or you're a 16. When you say, when you say, when you say, how do you drive? You mean like legally, obviously you can drive if you want to, but in terms of legally you can drive on a foreign license like if your friend lets you borrow their car and you're driving around it's not illegal for you to do that the the the, the question is uh if you're a french resident as i am and you don't have a french license it's technically illegal okay. right and so i'm telling you that when i rent a car in france and i drive it's illegal for me to do that technically but the car rental agency doesn't care it would only be, I want you to think through the steps of this. The way that I would get into trouble is if when I get pulled over by the French police officer, he then asks where my residency is, and then he connects the dot that my residency is older than this license. The only time I've ever been pulled over, I was already a French resident for three years, and I knew what was coming, so I turned into the dumb American. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm sorry, I don't speak French. Like, I, I like, I, I turned on, I turn, I, you know, I might, I might have, I might have come from Texas, actually, when that, when that cop, when that cop pulled me over, I might, excuse me, sir, monsieur, and uh, so I turned on, like, the, I don't speak French American, he goes, oh, uh, are you visiting, and the permutations went in his brain, like, I'm not gonna write this guy a ticket, he's never gonna pay the ticket, he doesn't even live here. Um, I'm not saying you need to be a, a con artist, as I was in that situation, but I'm saying that, uh, People, I, I suppose the underlying question here is how can I legally have a car in France and like get insurance and be registered? You have to have a French license. You, you can't do any of that on a U.S. license. Right. So if you plan on having a car in France, like get a license, get a license as soon as possible, whether that's through a, a, a swap or go into the system and be a 16 year old kid again. One third of the French population don't have a driver's license. If that gives you any sense of like how unnecessary a car is here. If you live in the countryside, you have to have a car. Like wow. there is no living in the French countryside without a car. Yeah, it's too far away. Everything's too far away, right? Yep. Um, McKinley is asking if you have a French license, does it then allow you to drive through all of the EU? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then Susan is asking, is there a way to find out if a vehicle will pass emission requirements in France on a website or by a year? Like, do you know that if they were to bring their you, own car? Uh, I mean, is it like an amazing collector's edition, like um, Sean Connery's Aston Martin from, uh, from Dr. No? I don't know that you'd want to do that because the EU has emission standards and uh, you're going to have, you might have to change the steering wheel over. Um, well, I, I suppose if you're not bringing it to England, but um, is there a way to do it? The Swiss have their own website. I suppose there could be, there could be one, but I would, I wouldn't encourage you to bring over a foreign car unless it's a collector's item. Okay. Um, I just encourage you to get a car here. That's fine. You can take an old question though. We have like two dozen more questions waiting. <laughs> do you? Uh, I'll, I'll run through a couple of these. Are work visas or jobs in France easier to get after you have graduated from a French university? Um, I would broadly say yes, insofar as there are good networking opportunities. The French, as I said on the last webinar, the way that their resume looks, which is what they call a CV here, um, lists their school at the top. 
it doesn't matter if they were in school 30 years ago or 10 years ago. In America, we look at your latest work experience. That's what matters to us. In French, what in France, what matters to you is where did you go to school? <laughs> so they have a great sense of networking around that. Oh, you went to this school, even though you went to that school 30 years ago. Uh, so insofar as those schools proactively help you get internships and opportunities with companies that have given them internships and opportunities for years. Yes. Yes. But uh, is it going to guarantee that's always up to you as an individual candidate and in the field that you're in. So I would just say slightly. Yes. Um, If you are on a student visa, are you able to work a remote job based out of the USA? Yes. Remember, you're always able to work a remote job. The French have no jurisdiction over your life outside of France. Um, but the additional thing about having a student visa is you're also allowed to work 24 hours a week in France at a French job. So you could double dip. You could have a job in France, you could have a remote job, and you could be a student. But why would you do that? Being a student in France, eat your baguettes, go to class occasionally, and like, Find out what it's like to date in France. Um, I, don't, I don't know why you're working two jobs, man. You left America already. Um, how does it look immigrating to Paris during COVID-19? Again, there was only the freeze in the early part, but students are coming back now. In fact, there's, I, rent a, I rent a room uh, on Airbnb in my house, and there's a Korean student there right now who's looking for a house. So he was planning to stay with me for two weeks while he found an apartment. So as far as I know, things are quite normal for us, depending on whether you already had a student visa or the country you're applying from, their consulate is open. So we're not closed for business in that sense. It just depends on your own country. Um, I, think, I think what is needed to get a French bank account? You need to have legal residence in France and you need to be firm with the French bank. So um, the, 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 the French don't want to help a US person um, insofar as they have to pay a lot of compliance fees to report back to um, the US on, on me. So I'm very grateful for my French bank. But generally speaking, oops. Did I switch off for a second? No. Okay, but generally speaking, as long as you have residence and you're a bit more forceful, there, and I have a list of banks, if, you, if there's a specific bank that you wanna target um, that will rent to, um, rent to Americans, that will let an American get a bank account um, there, I can, I can get that to you, just shoot me an email. But uh, you need to have residence. You can't open a French bank account from abroad unless it's already with the institution and they let you do that. Obviously the institution can let you do whatever you, they want, it's their bank. But as far as opening an account in France, you need to have residence here. Cool. Okay, I, I will, I'm dumping the old question, so it's just whatever you've got for me, Erica. And I know we've got about 20 more minutes, so let's light, we'll lightning round it. All right, so Marcel is asking, if we say move to France and then after a few years decide we'd rather be in Spain or elsewhere, do we have to go back to the US and start over or is it all like from the EU from there? It depends on what your status is. So for example, if you're on a four-year card or a 10-year card, you're an EU resident, man. Go where you want. The EU functions like the United States once you're inside and you have legal residence. And that's why I say citizenship doesn't matter if that's what you want. If you have EU resident status, you can go do that. Now, keep in mind, you are then tied to that country in terms of renewing your visa. So if you have a 10-year French visa and you decide in the second year of that, now mind you, that means you've lived in France seven years at that point because you've renewed five times and then you picked up a 10-year card at your soonest available opportunity. So now you have eight years to live in Spain, but then you need to figure out what you're gonna do. Are you gonna come back and renew the card in France? Well, good luck renewing a 10-year card without an address in France, mm -hmm. right? what you're likely to have done is transition to getting an equivalent visa in Spain. Mm -hmm. And can it help that you already have European residence somewhere else? Absolutely. Because what it's meant is you've already done checks and balances in another European country and you're not a problem. Okay. Um, 
but you you can do what you want. In fact, there was a, a Quebecois on the last call saying, Stephen, I want to move to Portugal. And I said, well, the Quebecois and France have a very aggressive visa programs with each other. You can come to France like like I think some, there's some ways to get paid to come to France as a, Quebec, as a Quebecois. And I said, just come to France and then move to Portugal. Um, there's your shortcut. Like you don't need to worry about getting a visa to Portugal. You have access to France. France is in the EU, move to Portugal. Again, the question will be, what's your visa regime afterwards? What's your plan for renewal? Because whenever you renew your visa, you're basically saying everything is the same as it was last time, man. Uh, but when you've been living in Portugal for eight years, <laughs> I don't think you're going to be able to make that. So it's just a way for you to, um, what, if you have a longer status card, I wouldn't do it when you have a one-year card, but when you have a longer card, like I have like a four-year card or a 10-year card, go and explore those other opportunities. Go live in those other countries if you want. Cool. Lauren is asking what kind of visa is your 10-year card under? Oh, okay, so a 10-year uh, carte de séjour isn't necessarily under uh, a regime. It means that for whatever reason, you have lived here successfully for five years, uh, and you're not in trouble. And so what that allows you to do is under any classification, you can then ask for a 10 year card. So I'm not applying for a 10 year card under Proflib because what's available to me at Proflib I think is another four year card, which I can get, which, which I would get if I wanted to next year. But I'm applying for the 10 year card for convenience. So it's not um, regime tested. It's I've fulfilled the requirements for five years. I've passed the language test. Um, you need to be at, it's currently A2. They're talking about moving it to B1. Um, but as long as you do all of that, you pass the language test, you're going to get the 10 year card. Like you need to screw up to not get it. You'll, you'll have like a 10 minute interview when you turn in your paperwork. But what they're doing is really shadow testing your French. They're going to talk to you about whatever. I think a friend of mine had a conversation about the, the guy asked her about her best friend and they talked about her best friend for like 20 minutes. But what he was really testing was your ability to talk about your best friend in the past tense, the imperfect, etc. So it was a shadow test. They, they don't really care about your best friend. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's incredible. Um, also really scary and complicated. Um, seems easy if you know it. Uh, okay, Alicia is asking, what kind of income are the French looking for that is believable to them? For which visa classification? Alicia, are you still up? for the PF? Pro, pro, pro they want you to be able to make the SMIC. I talked about in our last webinar, the SMIC is an abbreviation for the minimum wage in France, which is roughly 12 to 1400 euros a month. So if your business can bring in at least the SMIC in your first year, then you have every chance of getting a four year card. Cool. And then Michael is asking, uh, since it's 1,400 euros per, for one person, what would a married couple need? 2,800. Now, you can, um, so there's a couple different ways she can, he or she can come as your spouse. So there, there is, um, there's no mitigation of the amount. So if it's two people, you need more money. But if they're a helper in your business, then this would mean that, he or she would also have a separate pension set up and they would have health care through their participation in the business rather than as health care through you as a spouse. That is a discussion between you and I suppose your accountant in terms of what your financial planning is. Do you want her or him to have a separate pension um, because they're a helper in the business or do they just want them to be a trailing spouse uh, and not worry about any of that? But you're still going to have to bring in more income than a single person would. Sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> Susan just gave you a testimonial. I would just like oh. to know that I had a private consult with Stephen and it was great. Very helpful. If you have lots of questions, it was 75 euros for 30 minutes. They're worth every penny. You should put that on your website. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That's very kind. I appreciate it. That's awesome. Um, we have a question from Stephanie. What if you're retired, then apply for citizenship? Uh, if you have no income, can you still apply? Um, if you're, if you have no income and you're retired and you apply for citizenship, so this person has been legally living in France for five years? Uh, I assume not yet, but maybe by, 
by that. How, w- how would they live in France for five years without income, I guess would be my, my follow-up question. Mm. Because you, you're not going to be able to get here legally without proving you can live here with a set income, whatever that is. It's a minimum amount. It's not a lot. I mean, honestly, 1,400 euros a month is not bank-breaking money. But if you don't have that, the French aren't going to allow you to stay. What if um, you have savings? Yeah, again, if, if you prove that you have access to, to live here, the, okay. you're not, the citizenship is not means tested. It's not like you have to have money to become a citizen of France. The question is, have you uh, followed all the rules necessary to be a citizen? It's not required. Uh, you don't have to be wealthy <laughs> to become a citizen, sorry. You just need to have paid your taxes and lived here. You have to take a language test, there's a history test. You have to go to the prefecture for an hour long interview. The police are gonna come and interview your neighbors and inspect your house. Like there's a lot of stuff, um, all reasonable. The yeah. French secret service are gonna like do an investigation on you. Um, but um, yeah, it, money, don't worry about money. The French aren't concerned about that. They wanna know that you're French. They wanna know that you speak the language, that you love the country, that you live there. You're, you have neighbors who can attest the fact that you're not a jerk. They have a no jerk rule. If your neighbors say you're a jerk, you won't get it. I promise you that. Wow. Um, that's just how it is. Like, if you're going to make someone a citizen, a citizen, like, make sure they're not jerks. I think that's a fairly simple rule. Very simple. Um, okay, we have another question from Alicia. You have so many questions, Alicia. Um, can you supplement your new French income with U.S. investments? When you say supplement it, for whom? Like, let's say you have a French income that's much less than 1,400 euros, I'm assuming. So could you then say you have savings and some income? Or Well, it, if it's for the Prof. Lieb visa, you need to prove that your business is viable. You can't say like, oh, my business sucks, but I have money. Like, then you should have a visitor visa and live, <laughs> live based on your savings, right? But you can't cobble together mediocre French business and savings and say, between my mediocre French business and my savings, like, I'm good enough. The French will not accept that. Your, your business needs to bona fide make 1400 on its own. And I, I'm not saying profit, it's turnover. So top line revenue. You need to take in 1400 euros a month of, of revenue. Uh, and if you can't do that, then the French are like, you don't have a real business. Like, okay. you're just conning your way into the country. Cool. Answered. Um, Lauren is asking if you're on a pro leave visa, uh, can you change to a salaried visa in the oh, case? hundred oh. percent, but you, you're, you're going to pay to switch and either your employer is going to pay or you will, but it's not free to switch to a salary a visa. It's okay. still, you're basically like, you don't get any, you're still an American person. Like having a pro leave visa doesn't mean, Oh, he's already here on a pro leave or she's already here on a pro leave. Like, you get to skip. You still get to pay the money and go through the paperwork. Okay. You are a U.S. person applying for a salary A visa. You having another visa for classification is not anything in your corner. Okay. As far as the French bureaucracy care. And then do you need to always be sponsored by that company until like... Yeah. If you lose sponsorship, I think it's 60 days that you have to either find another job or leave the country. Or start another business or no? You could. You could start a business. Okay. Um, Kristen is asking, how many days a year must we spend in France not to lose our temporary residency status? Well, technically, it's 183 days a year, so one year more than half. But how are the French going to know that? Again, it's a moral assertion on your part. You're not morally required to be here 183 days a year. I, for me, I don't know why you wouldn't because it's an awesome country. But um, for tax purposes, you, you need to. So you're asserting that. But the French aren't tracking. They're like, oh, Erica left. She went to Malta last week. Erica, you've got seven days to get back here, girl. Okay. Um, the French have no way to track that. So it's simply your word that is asserting that. And I'm not saying lie or don't lie. I'm just saying um, the French don't really care as long as you pay your taxes. Because being there 183 days means you're a fiscal resident. That's the only way you're going to get to renew your visa successfully is because you're presenting tax returns every year that you filed. In order to file a tax return, you have to be a fiscal resident of France. To be a fiscal resident of France, you have to have been there at least 183 days of the year. Um, you can't renew your visa status without a tax return. Okay. 
All right. David is asking, can my spouse work in France for a French company if he's on a VLSTS Prof. visa? No, a Prof. Lead visa is not a work visa. It's a license for you to start your own business. It is not a salarié visa. If you want to work for a French company, you need to get a salarié visa in order to get a job. Um, you could get a student visa and work for a French company, but you're only allowed to work part time. So if the French company is willing to put you on for 24 hours a week and then is willing to then sponsor you when you're no longer a student, you could go that way. But, but a Prof. Lead visa is not a work visa. But it's for his spouse. So if uh, spouse, if, if you, if you, uh, it, uh, is, the, is the holder of the visa a Prof. Lead holder? Yes. Okay. The person that does the, 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 the spouse of the Prof. Lieb holder um, can get, can work uh, in France uh, in, in a limited capacity. Um, but I still think if you want to get like a real deal job, you still have to get a salary A visa. Like you're being the spouse of a Prof. Lieb holder doesn't shortcut the fact that you're still a U.S. person. However, I'm happy to uh, clarify that. If that person wants to email me, I can connect them with somebody who can clarify that for sure. But to me, it still seems that the mechanism would be such that you would, I know that you have work rights as the spouse of a Prof. Lieb holder, but I don't know if you have salary A work rights. But I, like I said, I can clarify that. If you want to shoot me an email, I'll be happy to do that. Um, your email. Erica, I, I, I want to let you do your closing stuff and then we'll come back and answer any, any last questions as well. Okay. That's okay. We can ask a few more questions and then I'll do the closing ones. Um, Alicia's asking, any recommendations for Im immersion programs or schools in Paris for a mature student who would apply for a student visa? Can you have a student visa and while still in France apply for a pro fleet? You can change from student to pro -fleet. Yep, you can. Uh, immersion programs, it just depends on where you are. So I made my greatest progress at a school out in Morzine called Alpine French School. Um, I know, I, I'm going to say this and you guys are going to be like, are you serious? But uh, depending on whether you go in the summer or the winter, you have classes in the morning, ski in the afternoon, classes, you could ski in the, you could ski in the morning too. And then there's classes in the evening. Um, I went, I went for 30 days and my skiing improved just as much as my French did. I suppose when you ski for 30 straight days, this can happen as well. But, um, it's, uh, any time that you're in an immersion program, uh, and I would recommend outside of Paris in terms of saving money, just remember that you're going to pick up the accent of that region. Um, I had lived in Paris lo long enough <laughs> that when I got there, so, um, uh, Morzine is in, um, uh, Franche Comté. Um, no, it's in Haute-Savoie, and uh, I have a Parisian accent. So everyone immediately, oh, I know where you're from, of course, which is, you know, if you're from the countryside, like, oh, that Parisian accent. Um, but if you don't already have an accent, you are likely to pick up the accent of whichever region that you're doing your immersion course in. So if you do your immersion course in Lille or in Nantes or in Bordeaux or in Provence, you're going to pick up, and there's nothing wrong with that. People will usually ask you like, oh, like, uh, are you from Provence? And you're like, no, no, I, I just took my French classes there. Um, so just keep in mind, it'll be cheaper, but you're gonna pick up the accent likely of the instructors there. That's an awesome point. Also, Doug was asking, when you relocated to France in 2013, what was your then facility with the French language, speaking, reading, writing, and how <laughs> has I call it the difference between studying, studying French and learning French. So outside of an immersive culture, the words and sounds don't make any sense to an English speaker. And in fact, your English brain is constantly correcting you. Um, like the number one, okay? It's, it looks like UN and your English brain goes, oh, that's un or un. Uh, no, it's un. Uh. <laughs> that's the number one. And I want, you know, I want to tell you, I couldn't say that when I lived in the US with my French tutor. She'd always go over it over and over and over. And when you come to France and you hear it, 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 and then you repeat it, that's how you learned English. Your mom spoke to you, your dad spoke to you, and you repeated back. You didn't go to a classroom. So I've come to really reject classroom learning as a way to make great progress in French. I really believe it's through conversation and say one-on-one tutorials. 
But um, there's a lot to be said for before you come, learn your grammar, get your basic, you know, A1, A2 out of the way. But it's night and day what I, and I studied before I moved to France, like I really did. Um, but all of my studies outside of an immersive environment, if you added up a year of Stephen studying in the US, they don't equal one month in France with no tutor, just <laughs> listening, just listening, paying attention, looking at newspapers, looking at magazine advertisements. Um, I, I, my, one of my French friends laughed the other day because I got one of those, you know, the little mailers for the supermarket. I pick those up and I read them because <laughs> I'm looking, I'm looking for words I don't know, or I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for food items I don't know or something like that. So I, I look, I'll circle stuff and he's quite amused. It's like everyone else in France throws those away. Stephen picks them up to like uh, learn stuff. So um, an immersive environment for a language like France, which has such a foreign structure of noise and sounds. Here's, here's a fun one. How do you pronounce the word R-E-I-M-S? So this is a town which in English we'd say Reims, right? It's the one of the champagne capitals of France. Do you know how it's pronounced in French? Reims. <laughs> You're like, where, where is the H? Where is the TZ? Uh, no explanation, it's Reims. Um, I can say that very easily now, but I promise you, like my first year here, I was like, hey, eh, hey, eh, hey, eh, hey. Eh. It's all about how you're moving your mouth and how things are structured. And um, you, once you're here, you're gonna make great progress. Don't beat yourself up and don't be like, I have to learn all of the French in 17 days. That's how I came. When I came here, I was like, I'm gonna learn all the French. Um, and it's slower progress. Just be patient with yourself. There's no rush, you live here now. Right. right. Uh, we have a handful of questions that we're not going to get to. Uh, we've dropped Stephen at thelifeyouwant.eu is his email address. We have a testimonial from Susan. So if you have tons more questions, you can I'm putting time. I'm putting a Quora answer that I wrote in 2014. So I lived in France a little under a year at that point, but it was just a, what did it feel like to move to the United States from France? Um, take a look at that and let me know if there's anything you'd like me to add to that. I'm actually thinking of updating that answer. But take a read. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, okay. And then the this, last question I'm, I want to ask. This, this, bad, this, this one is going to die, Erica, so I'm just going to switch over to my, my okay. phone. So I'm not leaving, just this, this camera is leaving, okay? Okay. Uh, one, one second. Go for it. It's going to pop up. All right. Here we go. We'll unmute you. Can you unmute? Perfect. This is the last question we'll end with, and it's from Jess. Um, how are the current race relations and or gender relations there? Could a minority move with modest income and be treated fairly? Okay, so um, a timely, interesting, and thoughtful question. It's not an ideal last question of the day mm -hmm. because it's one that would require a lot. I think I would answer firstly by reminding you that race relations in France are very unlike race relations in the US because France had a global empire. So they had Africans moving here and have legal rights to move here to this day. Uh, Asians, um, there's a French colony, uh, former French colony in South America. <laughs> so um, race relations here are not as fraught, honestly. America, we have, uh, I don't buy the narrative that everyone in America is racist. I, I, I really reject that idea. But let's just say racism is less of a problem here in France than it is in Europe. Um, uh, sorry, as it is in the United States. So I wouldn't worry about the, the race part. Um, as far as diversity goes, that's, uh, sorry, as far as gender goes, it's a slightly loaded question because uh, as even though like French women were going topless on the beach in the 60s, like they only had the right to open a bank account in like the 70s. Um, they only got the right to vote, I think, in the 50s or the 60s. So um, French women consider themselves quite liberated. But I would say that you have to understand, and I explain this, and I, I, I'll close my answer with this. In America, I would never in a million years think of complimenting Erica for her sweater choice if we worked in an office together, because that is so illegal. And even though Erica and I know each other and we've actually done some work together, 
I would be too afraid as a man to say that in America. In France, the attitude is, I wore the sweater. Did you not notice I wore the sweater? And so like French women in the workplace expect to be complimented and they don't hate it when you say like, I like your sweater. Um, that is simply a cultural difference. So for um, the very patriarchal system of France, um, I, the relations are just totally different. Like the things that you would get killed for in America, like I like your sweater, Erica, like how dare you like my sweater? Like I would totally expect that in America, but in France, a woman would say, thank you. I, you know, that's why I wore it. I wanted to get a compliment. Um, that's, a, like I said, I could go on and on, but I wouldn't worry if you're a female minority who wants to move to France, please feel welcome. You will be welcomed. Okay. All right. Don't leave yet because I believe Stephen has something else to say after I just make a few announcements. I'm going to share my screen and show this baby again. Oops. So I don't know how to make it any bigger. Anyway, you guys could see. Uh, <laughs> so, so here we go. Uh, so here is where you can find all of our events. We spend a lot of time getting you really awesome speakers. Tomorrow we have Ava who's coming on to teach about what, or to talk about what it's like to teach and live in South Korea. Personally, I lived and taught in South Korea for 14 months and saved $21,000 while having the time of my life. So if that sounds at all interesting to you, it's similar, even though I did it like seven years ago and I'm super passionate. I've sent plenty of people to teach in South Korea. So I'm so happy Ava's lived there and taught there the last few years and she's super excited to do this presentation. Tomorrow we also have a California happy hour going on. So if you are in California, if you just love California, you're welcome to join in. Those are not presentations. That's just discussions around travel and we do them like region by region. Um, we also have uh, Kamau and Selena are coming on next week, how to make the most of your vacations during the coronavirus. Um, so how to make them safe and make the most of your time. And then on Thursday or Wednesday, I believe, um, we have Corey Lee who travels the world in a wheelchair and he just published his first children's book and it took him a few years and he's learned so many things. And it's something that I've heard over and over from people that they want to do this. So I'm having him come on and share his knowledge about how to do it and what not to do. And so that's going to be amazing. Um, and also you, you know, this is the URL, the nomadicnetwork.com slash events, and you can find all of them. We have a dozen events up there. Um, these take an incredible amount of effort um, on our team's part, um, aside from Steven, who obviously put this together and, you know, loves it. I am full-time working for Nomadic Matt. And so we definitely are suffering during the coronavirus. So we ask that if you found this of any value um, that you either join our exclusive Patreon community, which is a really cool community where you can get tons of extras like these TNN event replays, which this will be up tomorrow, um, or like stories, you get extra talks with Nomadic Matt and the team and different people, you get free signed books, you can get tickets to TravelCon, all sorts of things, access to our courses. So that's um, on Patreon and for as little as $3 a month, you can be a Patreon member. And if you don't want to do anything monthly, this is a QR code for our PayPal donation. Uh, and that is just really awesome. If you want to just donate one time, uh, if you can't use the QR code, uh, that is on every single invitation on our website. So you could just find the link there. And I just want to say thank you to Steven, but also thank you to all of you for being a part of our community. It was a really awesome, again, two hour long event. And I have to say, I was very uh, heart warmed by seeing so many people taking notes. And I just love this community. You guys asked a trillion questions, which is always welcome. And thank you so, so much, Steven. Thank you, community. And Steven, do you have any last words? Yeah, just, to, uh, well, I'll give you, I'll give you guys, uh, I know it's not uh, the end of the day wherever you guys are, but here's a, a bit of a sunset shot for you and uh, a bit of a pitch to give into Nomadic Matt. I said last time that 
anyone who would donate, obviously you get access to the replay. So if you joined late and you wanted access to the Q&A, if you were a Patreon member. However, I'm also going to throw in additional incentives um, that if you're not, either you can give a donation or you can, uh, sorry, okay, so I'll pan around. <laughs> People are like, what is, what else is going on? Um, so um, you can pan around. Uh, so if you give a one-time donation, just send me a receipt, or if you're already a Patreon member, send me a receipt, and I will, um, I'll give you access to one of my three travel courses. So, so it's not three travel courses. I, I last time, uh, last webinar, I gave people free access to my travel course. So not to repeat it for those people who already gave last time, I'll also give you free access to either my Airbnb, how to become an Airbnb super host course, or my how to host a, how to host a meetup for money, um, how to earn money as a meetup host uh, course. So if you just send me a receipt to the email address, which Erica's already provided, uh, that you've either given a one-time donation or you are already a Patreon member, I'll send you a coupon to give you 100% off one of those courses. That is super generous, Stephen. We are just, we feel very lucky to have you as a part of the team, as a chapter leader in Paris, and as a double speaker, and I believe a triple speaker, because we had some comments about how they want you back to speak about Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Have a great day wherever you are, night. I don't know what time it is. Looks amazing in Croatia. Um, have the best day. Thank you for coming. And feel free to email Stephen. Feel free to email me. We're always here. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everybody.